How's it going, people? I'm James from The Paint People. Welcome if you're new. Today, we're gonna go over the 10 important tools that you need to paint a room. And I actually discovered an amazing article from HGTV. The author is Emma Yardley, and let me tell you, she knows what she's talking about. Let's go over this article together. We'll go through each of the tools, and I'll also add some extra little tidbits throughout and at the end. That way, you are super equipped, whether you're just painting this one room or you wanna be a full-fledged DIY professional. Does that contradict Predict itself, DIY, professional. Oh well. Also a quick shout out to Mighty Boards because if you are painting, first you gotta test your colors out. And the best way to do that is use a large testable board like a Mighty Board because they hold the paint really well, they're flexible, and they're massive. So check them out if you're not familiar. So I think it's really important to consider your process when you're painting. Obviously the first tool you would think of is a paintbrush and a roller, but that's not the first tool you use. You gotta start with a prep. So the first tool we're talking about is drop cloths. Protect your floors before you start painting. Drop cloths are pretty essential when it comes to painting, unless you enjoy a Jackson Pollock look on your brand new floors. What they do is they catch those inevitable drips from your brush and your rollers. And you do not want to spend your time cleaning up every little speck of paint that you get on the floor. So drop cloths are a great way to do that. You can buy the plastic ones that are kind of one-time use, but Emma knows what she's talking about. She recommends canvas drop cloths. These are the ones that are made of a uh, thick fabric that sit really, really well. You can also get canvas drop cloths that have a plastic or more specifically a rubberized bottom. So not only will paint not seep through if a lot of it does get put on there, but also it can help with gripping the surface too. So in cases like stairs, I love using those kind of rubberized drop cloths because they tend to stay put and you're not gonna slip on them as easily. Always be careful though when you're walking on drop cloths. A little bonus tip that's a little more professional, especially if you have a lot of contractors working in the space, is cardboard on the floor. You'll find at your local paint store, big rolls of cardboard that you can lay down and then tape to the floor. That way it's gonna stay there for days or weeks or however long you need to use it. Drop cloths, they can shift and move a little bit. So if you're not really diligent with making sure they're always against the baseboards or the walls, whatever you're painting, you might have those cases where maybe a little bit of floor is peeking out and that's exactly where the paint will drop. Trust me, I know. But for the DIY person, drop cloths are totally great. Versatile, you can reuse them. Off to a good start. Next up we have Dip Dap. <laughs> Ready to use spackling. I know DAP Drydex is really popular. It's the one that Emma's recommending here. Some of these products have a handy feature where they're pink when they're wet and then they're white when they're dry. So you know exactly when it's time to sand them. This is another example of proper prep is super crucial. So before you start painting everything, make sure you fill all those little nicks on the walls and any little holes that you may have. And if you're taking maybe pictures off and there's nails stuck in the wall, if that nail isn't staying there, then take it out, plaster over that hole, and you're good to go. What's great about some of these Drydex products is they go on pink and then when they're dry, they turn white, which is very handy. But I will recommend a little quick tip here. If you're spackling a wall that's white, it may be hard to figure out where you spackled. So sometimes I might have a piece of colored chalk and I just do a little mark on each bit of spackling just so I can keep track of where everything is. Sometimes it's obvious if it's a heavy repair job, but for the small ones, you wanna make sure that you know exactly where they are in case you need to sand them. Number three, we have the putty knife, which is obviously super important if you're doing your repair work. It's always nice to have two because one can hold the spackling and then you could take as much as you need with the clean one, apply it and you're good to go. If you try and do both with one, it can be a bit of a mess. So maybe have one that's larger and one that's smaller, like two and three inches or even larger if you feel like it. Number four is sanding sponges. I love these details that she's incorporating. So yes, you could just go with sandpaper, right? That's fine. I normally have a piece of sandpaper in my pocket just in case I need to. If I notice something that wasn't sanded properly, I can do it on the spot. But what's great about sanding sponges is it just tends to be a bit easier. I like having a slightly rougher sandpaper sponge and then a really fine one to sort of finish things off. What's kind of nice about sanding sponges is you can kind of apply pressure where you need to and sort of dial it in as you're sanding rather than just having the paper itself. A pole sander is very, very useful if you're sanding larger areas, but for the smaller repairs, I love these sponges. So great suggestion. Number five is a sturdy ladder. And yes, you do want it to be sturdy, but I will say you also want it to be fairly light because you will be using this ladder 
a lot. You'll be moving it from different parts of your room. Make sure it's the right height for the room that you're in. And also it'd be nice to have a little platform that can accommodate a paint can. So you're not having to sort of drag that up with you. It can just sit nicely as you're doing your brushwork and all that. You can also find a ton of different accessories to add onto your ladder to hold your equipment. But I think the most important part is it has to be sturdy and ideally light. So it's kind of best of both worlds. Number six, is painter's tape. Some painters may tell you, I never use tape for painting. Well, they're lying. Every painter uses painter's tape. It may be for different purposes. Some people might like to tape off their baseboards and their edges to make sure their lines are clean. Other people may use tape to create striping on the walls, like a nice little full finish. You can also use tape to cover up your light switches and your outlets to make sure that no paint gets on them. That's important too, covering doorknobs or door handles if you're not removing them. Also securing that cardboard we talked about to the floor. And one of my favorite uses for painter's tape is labels. I love to label my paint cans with whatever room I'm using them in. I label my water bottle so no one else drinks it on the job. It's such an invaluable tool that you can use for so many different purposes. Just be sure you're getting the right tape. So the green stuff tends to be the universal painter's tape, but if you need something more delicate, you could look at blue tape depending on the brand or even purple tape for even more delicate surfaces. Because if you have a somewhat freshly stained hardwood floor, for example, you don't want to put a heavy duty tape on that or even a painter's tape for too long because it may peel off the finish. So just be aware of the surface that you're using that tape on. Very important. We're at number seven and we're finally getting to paintbrushes and quality paintbrushes is important too. So typically speaking, you want to get a good brush. I do have some painters that I used to work with that would get dollar store brushes and just buy one for each job, but I think it's much easier and it's much more effective if you just invest in something solid. Get something that's comfortable in your hand by a reputable brand. We'll hold the paint better, it'll be easier to maintain and clean, and your bristles aren't gonna fall out as you're using it. If I were to recommend one type of brush, it would be a 2.5 inch angled sash. I find that is kind of a nice, happy medium universal brush, whether you're doing trim or walls. Smaller brushes are good for those details. And then larger brushes can just cover more surface area. So if you need to paint a lot, they're good. But they'll also be heavier because they'll be holding more paint. So after a while, your arm might get tired. So just keep that in mind as well. Number eight is rollers. Super important as well. Your rollers are gonna be covering 90% of the walls that you're painting. So you wanna make sure that you get a good roller that is lint free. So you're not picking out little bits of fluff in your painted walls. 3 8 inch nap is what Emma's recommending here which is a pretty standard kind of thickness, I would say. And that synthetic core is good for usability because you can wash it and reuse it as many times as you can. The whole roller setup has three main components, essentially. You have your roller sleeve, which is the fluffy bit, and then the roller cage, which is what the sleeve goes onto and has that kind of handle. More importantly though, get a good extension pull because that'll give you a lot more leverage. It'll be a lot easier on your back and you'll be able to reach all parts of the wall and even the ceilings without having to go up and down a ladder. Number nine is a tray. Now, this is kind of uh, self-explanatory, I think, if you know about rollers, because a tray is what holds the paint for the roller. You're not gonna dip a whole roller into the can. You'll have it in the tray, and then you'll be able to dip it in there and then smooth it out on that tray to make sure you get the appropriate amount of paint on that roller sleeve. She says, uh, bypass metal roller trays, which I kind of agree with. They can sort of warp and then go for hard plastic trays instead. She says the plastic inserts are wasteful, but uh, I gotta say, I love a plastic insert, <laughs> especially on job sites without water where I can't really wash the tray out. I just use an insert. But as long as you're using those water-based paints and you're able to wash your tray quickly after using it, your tray should last you quite a while. So she's right on that. And number 10 is paintbrush cleaner, which is an interesting one. Um, I never use paintbrush cleaner. Specifically talking about interior latex paint, which is kind of the most commonly used paint in DIY projects. I just use good old soap and water and I get a nice little 15 in one paint tool or some sort of brush scraper to sort of clean the bristles. I never really ever messed with cleaner to be honest. But that's just my experience. Maybe it's different for you. Some other things that I would add on to this list is a good knife, an X-Acto knife, because 
If you're cutting the cardboard for your floor, you'll need a knife. Also plastic, big clear rolls of plastic are really, really important because not only do you need to cover your floors, you gotta cover your furniture as well. And the best way to do that is with that clear plastic that has that sort of static clingy technology and it can just conform to whatever you're using it on. Another thing that you can do, which is a little more advanced perhaps, is while you're doing your spackling, get a good dripless yellow caulking gun and some caulk as well to clean up all those little gaps and those separations in your woodwork. But other than that, that's a pretty solid place to start in terms of your painting tools. I'm curious to hear what your go-to tools are that aren't on this list. Let me know in the comment section below. And of course, right over here is another video that I think you'll be really, really interested in.